archetype. So Terrence and Dennis McKenna, they were one of the teams who were trying to figure this out, and they succeeded just about the same time. I mean, it was like there was a zeitgeist right then. It was that the mushroom wanted to burst forth, and it was just like doing it in a slightly different way for everyone who was trying, and everyone who was trying wanted to get it figured out and then hurl it out into the world. It was the same impulse. It was really moving through everywhere. But uh, Terrence and Dennis got a uh, book contract with a little press and or press in Berkeley, and they said, great, because we need an illustrator, and I had an art degree in. So we set out to put this book together, which we did over um, about three months. We were very intense young people who, as I say, took ourselves very seriously. Um, and we took our mission to, to change the world very seriously, you know? So uh, this, is, uh, this is the week that the book came out, which was a few months later in January of 1976. And the very next day, we got on the plane from the Amazon for our next mission, which was to find ayahuasca and figure out what to do with that. Um, and so that was us in a camera store while I was trying to figure out which camera to buy for the Amazon. Um, so the book, I want to talk about a bit because, again, these sort of little memes of this is how you do it, or this is something you need to know about, went out into the world through this book. It was the first of the books that came out, and another wave of, followed shortly after by other authors about how to grow um, psilocybin mushrooms. But um, the, the logo was a jar with a mushroom in it right there. Home, canning, cozy, cultivated, do it yourself, you know. So if you're seeing the sort of symbolism of each step we took, we I can't say claim that we were totally savvy about everything we were putting out there. We were operating within this same kind of uh, impetus, this whatever it was, like consciousness impetus to express itself in mushrooms in the hands of people and just distribute itself as an organism. And um, so, you know, the dedication acknowledged Wasson and, of course, Dr. Schultes, who was our, oh, Albert Hoffman. Dr. Schultes is not there. He's elsewhere. But, uh, and Albert Hoffman, who, of course, uh, discovered LSD, but also um, identified psilocybin later on after mushrooms had been brought back from Mexico to Switzerland. And, um, and eventually that was able to be synthesized. And this concept of that something happens there that can't be described, the ineffable, um, was part of this mystique also, this mystique attractor. This is the back of the book. And um, so we're showing, you know, this is the home. And here it's saying how easy it is. Doesn't it say that it's a seventh grade science project? <laughs> super easy, right? Um, it's not super easy no. for everybody, uh, as we found out. But once we succeeded, especially with beginner's luck, with a bunch of, which a bunch of us had. We hadn't hit you know, massive contamination and this and that, all the different problems yet. We were just like, wow, you just like put this and that and heat it up and put it there and spray it, and it just becomes this amazing thing. We had to teach everybody about mushrooms, to teach them what gills are, what spores are, what veils are, you know, that, that they like humidity, but they also need air. I mean, just a whole, people didn't, eat mushrooms in their cuisine, and they didn't grow them, and they didn't think about taking them, and to grow them in your own home, and you had to learn like basic biology. And you had to learn, as you know, you had to learn uh, semi-sterile lab techniques. And the idea of semi-sterile meant very different things to very, to very many people. <laughs> um, I mean, if you guys went to college or lived with a bunch of guys in an apartment or something like that, where the dishes got washed every two weeks, and people thought that was semi-sterile. <laughs> so in the table of contents, you see here all the things that, we're, that we felt we had to put out there to help people understand what was ahead of them. Locating and identifying. You want to be sure you get the right fungus. Collecting how you make spore prints. Uh, what, how you make uh, sterilized material agar, or we cooked up potatoes. We made a lot of just potato agar from just cooking, baking potatoes, you know? And just the folk method, really, right from the beginning. Um, casing, recasing, what do these terms even mean? What's that? I thought the casing was the hard part. Yeah, I thought that was the hard part, because it was sometimes a source of contamination. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So you had to learn what to do about that. So all of these parts here, and then preserving them, which I find some people still don't know, you actually have to dry them bone dry for them to, and then put them in you know, an airtight container for them to retain their psilocybin because it breaks down in, in humidity. And you know, I don't know if you've ever been given a gift of some limp, dried <laughs> mushrooms that have rehydrated from the air, but it's disappointing, you know? <laughs> so there are just basics there, and the, the, the whole glossary of understanding that. And then, in the book, we did a series of photographs, and uh, how-to photographs. It was a how-to book. And um, we were growing them in jars, and, uh, and then filling, um, I'll show you on the next picture, I think, filling uh, styrofoam, we were getting styrofoam boxes from aquarium stores and filling those up with jars and cutting a hole in the top and putting a piece of clear plastic into the top of the aquarium box and then selling these, that's what you see there, um, and then selling these uh, to people who liked the idea of homegrown psychedelics. It just had so many problems implicit in it. It was, um, and, and I have to just, point out that this is absurd that we did a how-to photograph on an ancient shag carpet. <laughs> we did it in a, in a hood. We had a, we made a homemade, you know, inoculation hood and all that. But we actually... It, all hippies have shag carpets in yeah. those. <laughs> but you didn't put your new fresh mushroom jar on the shag no. carpet. That was like, we should have had a sign that said, do not do this. Yeah, yeah. Instead, this was, do this. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, Actually, we all took pseudonyms. So I, back on the title page, you saw that the authors were O. N. Eric and O. Um, o. T. Os and O. N. Eric. And O. T. Os means uh, obscure, hidden, and O. N. Eric means like, from the dream world. And so Terence and Dennis took those two names. I just used Cat, just one name. And uh, the photographer Jeremy Bigwood, who was one of this crew of, you know, competing mushroom guys, he came down from Washington from a different team and um, offered to take the photographs, and, but he said, you have, can't put my name, call me Iramesh the Obscure. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, how gone, that's how he's gone down in history. And we actually entertained for a while that later when we realized how stupid this shag carpet was, that maybe he'd come to like sabotage our project <laughs> and put it on the carpet. <laughs> but, um, Paranoia. <laughs> Uh, so that was the way that it was packaged then, and um, and people were interested because I to back up a bit in like 1972 I had been interested in I heard there's mushrooms out there somewhere, and people started selling in the Bay Area started selling, um, gosh they were just uh, store bought mushrooms saturated in fairly lousy LSD. I don't know how many of you guys got those, but I was way into a trip on it and I'm like, this is way too familiar. This is this has got <laughs> psilocybin in. And a number of people had thought, well it's not any different than LSD because they were taking these fake <laughs> mushrooms. So by the time we said no we're actually growing the real thing, people were interested to grow it. But then they didn't know they'd get a jar with a lid on it full of mycelium just freshly cased, and um, I don't know, I think it was $20 a jar. And then they were to mist that and give it air and put it in a humid container and um, take care of it and harvest. Notice when it was pinning, the little one's coming up, and then watch it and mist it and harvest it correctly. And when you correctly harvest it, not leave decaying material there. And all the basic rules of taking care of mushrooms that we all know now. But um, it was amazing how few people could do that. And we had a very good friend who was a very elegant dealer. And um, <laughs> and he you know, was just totally discreet. And he was excited about this, though. So he started taking them around. And then he started getting complaints from people saying, it all turned green. Is this what it's supposed to look like? Or look, it completely dried up because I went away for two weeks. I forgot about it. Or my dog, you know. Oh ate half of it or something, and they'd want to give it back, and he'd come back to us with boxes of like disgusting jars and say, this is not why I signed up for dealing psychedelics. This, I'm not going to do this. You need to find another way to distribute. If your mission is to distribute the mushroom to the world, you need to find another way. So then we, we 
broke through, of course, to, oh, the picture isn't there, but to packaging them and drying them and packaging them in little packets. And we dried and packed five gram units and sent that out because that was what one transmission had told us was the right amount. <laughs> and, uh, of course, we know that's a fairly substantial amount, <laughs> but um, that's how it went out for a long time, and a lot of other people made it that way and sent it out that way too, and then and started sending sending it out and growing it in a much larger scale, sending it out at a different scale, you know, all the variations on how on how contraband is um, distributed arose. But um, in the book, I want to say a bit more about that because these influences kept coming through. And one was that it was known that there were at least 200 uh, mushroom stones, like a foot and a half, two feet tall, um, carved by people who are within the Mayan realm of southern Mexico and Guatemala and who um, are no longer there no, or no longer using the mushroom, have no other record of it except a couple of these old paintings, like the one I showed you earlier and these stones, but the stones were really a remarkable thing. And, um, mm -hmm. and so I illustrated the book and I imagined, um, you know, them tucked away in the forests of, uh, of southern Mexico and Guatemala, and that's where that image arose from. And, um, and then Terence's transmission was that uh, the mushrooms came from outer space, and so he, um, you know this book, how many of you? know or have this first little grower's guide. Just a couple of you. Yeah. Well, there are a number of editions. I have them all at the library up here in Occidental if you want to come visit. I'm going to have an open house tomorrow from 10 to 2 at the library if you'd like to come yeah. see right. Ethnobotany and Ethnomycology. Cool. At the library? At, at the, your library. Okay. At the Botanical Dimensions Library, the north end of Occidental at the Occidental Center for the Arts. Mm -hmm. On your left is your leading town going north. Um, so this theory spawned, so to speak, this um, illustration and their relationship to outer space. And it came partly out of a, yeah, this research that had been done only a short time prior to that about what chitin is. You know, chitin is a very, uh, very hard, um, uh, what is it, a poly saccharide, actually, I think. It's very super hard. It's what the exterior, the exoskeleton of insects and, and uh, um, shellfish is made of, but it's also what the exoskeleton of spores are made of. And so the theory, and it's still tossed around, is that, mm -hmm. is that spores could actually travel through space with this chitin exterior and with the um, static electricity charge that they set up on the exterior of that tiny sphere that, um, that could allow them to go through great distances. So that, that and the nature of the hallucinations led to this as one of the theories, but also the strangeness of the voices and the messages and the long time, the sense that the mushroom had been watching, basically, since way before humans and would be way after humans. That was a very distinct um, quality for many of us of those experiences that I wouldn't say came from LSD. We got different stuff from from acid, but we got this sense of life over an incredibly long time and our small window on it uh, from the mushroom. And, and I really, you know, I mean, I do make jokes about all of this, but I, I really, really treasure the insights that um, psilocybin has, has given us. And, I, and for me, having been able to be with indigenous people who are in the lineage that's gone on for untold generations, and then to be smack dab in the middle of this counterculture, as we used to call it, subculture, and now, you know, blooming mushroom people culture. Um, it's, it's just really precious. I'm just really glad to be, be here right now, even with the obvious shadows that are hanging over us in the intensity of the times. It's a time of change and understanding. And one of the things that I got out of all of this, even before I went to start working um, so intensely with Native people, is the sense of animism, the sense that everything is alive, that everything is conscious, that everything can communicate with each other, and that if we personify or see kind of the entity in each life form, sometimes even in objects, then we have the basis for a much more engaged heart and mind relationship to each of those entities or species or places or um, 
Um, mm, blush. Well, I'll say.